Hello hackers, welcome to the third video in the return oriented programming module of Pwn College. I'm Jan and I will be talking to you about ROP techniques. Um, this is going to be a smorgasbord of um, concepts, techniques and hints for cre successfully creating ROP chains. Um, and we will start with a um, not a problem, but a common thing that people wonder, where do I store data? When you create shellcode, you, um, and, and your shellcode needs to open the slash flag file, you often put the slash flag uh, string at the end of your shellcode and you use a um, rip relative instruction, such as load effective address, rip plus whatever, to um, point a register at that flag. What's the cool in shellcode? It's actually something very similar, right? When you're uh, triggering shellcode uh, in, in a ROP chain, sorry, when you're triggering a ROP chain, you override the stack, you can write data onto that stack, right? The trick is if you write data onto the stack, you have to be careful not to return, not to treat that data as a return address as part of your ROP chain. Um, so here's a, a, a potential um, um, ROP chain that you, you, you push, you know, the, the address of a gadget that will, um, uh, let's say, pop RDI so, um, or pop RSI or something. So this is, um, you know, slash flag. Um, it will pop the address of slash flag. The problem is um, the address of slash flag is two gadgets to the right. Your first gadget might return into uh, what is actually your second gadget, which is uh, a gadget that you will exclusively keep there to jump over this gadget to return to gadget four so that you don't accidentally return to uh, treat slash flag as a return address and uh, try to jump to um, memory that is you know, in little endian, G A L F forward slash, which likely isn't mapped and your program will crash. And it's the same idea for uh, bin cat as well. Um, how do you uh, do this sort of jumping over? Well, you use what, what I call, there's no standard name for them, but what I call janitorial gadgets. Your, a lot of gadgets are there to fix up your ROP chain. If you have data interspersed into your op chain, or if the program um, that you're overflowing actually corrupts part of your op chain, you might have to jump over corrupted parts. Um, there are plenty of op chains that will do that. If there are registers that you don't care about, um, that you don't mind uh, clobbering with uh, whatever data you have on the stack, um, that you have written to the stack, you just trigger these uh, uh, something like a ROP, a ROP gadget that pops data to those um, registers. Um, in the uh, simple ROP example that we um, ran through last video, um, we had in the, di di in the disassembly, um, in the foo function, when we uh, triggered the open slash flag afterwards, it popped RBP. And we put garbage there, but we could have put data there. Uh, that this um, uh, gadget at 401 1C2, if we jump there, it will pop RBP and RET. We don't have to do the open, etc., etc. We could just use this as a stack cleanup gadget to just jump over eight bytes of garbage on the stack, um, which is uh, super cool. Similarly, there's a lot of um, uh, gadgets that will clean up a stack frame, right? Deallocate um, a part of the stack frame. So if you had allocated uh, 40 bytes uh, or hex 40 bytes onto a stack frame, there's likely a gadget that will um, subtract 40 bytes from uh, RET, which is uh, super cool as well. Um, or sorry, subtract 40 bytes, add, re, <laughs> let me start that uh, over. If there's uh, a function that you find that has a stack frame of 40 bytes, in the beginning of the function, it likely subtracts hex 40 from RSP. At the end of the function, it will add that back on and you can uh, 
reuse that as a you know skip over ga garbage gadget cool um another uh rob concept how do you uh store um values into your registers um well you can use um register popping gadgets right so if you want to point rax to slash flag um you find a gadget that says that does pop rax ret these exist they're not super common usually they have other side effects as well um and then you put that gadget the address of that gadget then the desired value you want to get popped into rax when you return to this gadget you of course override the return address with this gadget pop rax will run it'll pop this ret will run and jump to gadget two. In this case, it'll presumably clean up slash flag off the stack. Cool. All right. Um, another concept, uh, some gadgets are more common than others. Um, the most common gadget is ret, right? It's, it's at the end of every function. Um, and uh, actually as a gadget on its own, it is useful. You might recall the concept of a NOP sled in shellcode. Well, in ROP chains, there's something called a RET sled. Very, very similar. If you just put a bunch of RET gadgets to overflow the stack, as long as one of them overflows the return address, you will then RET, 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 all the way to your actual ROP chain. Similar to a NOP sled. Um, Leave ret is a very common gadget as well at the end of many functions. Um, you have to be careful if you have corrupted RBP um, and you do leave, you will corrupt RSP as well. Leave does move RSP, RBP, pop RBP. So you want to make sure that RBP is pointing to um, a, an, an address that makes sense. Um, another uh, relatively common, uh, very common gadget is pop some register and then ret. This is uh, especially seen when restoring Kali saved registers before returning. Um, it is very frequent. Um, and it's it's seen for a wide variety of registers. Sometimes you even see it for RAX, where you uh, maybe you don't pop RAX, but you move something to RAX and then return. That is setting a return value of a function. Um, some gadgets are common because the functionality is pretty common in a binary, like leave ret or pop some certain registers and ret. Um, but you can jump again into the middle of an instruction. This means that certain gadgets are common because there are other common gadgets that contain the bytes that encode um, those instructions, right? An, a trivial example, let me disappear my camera so you can see. A trivial example is that um, every gadget of add RSP8 ret, which is a relatively, uh, I mean, conceptually common, this, this sort of deallocation of the stack uh, frame, also contains an add ESP8 ret gadget if you jump past that H prefix. Again, that H prefix, you are probably by now very painfully aware, is what changes operations on ESP and EAX and so forth to RSP, RAX, and so forth. In general, the longer the um, instruction in bytes, the more rare it will randomly appear in a binary. But certain instructions, even long ones, will appear frequently because they are frequently used. Um, all right, um, another concept, how do you store addresses into registers? Addresses you might not otherwise have um, uh, known. I um, mentioned that long instructions are less likely to randomly appear. Load effective ad uh, address is one such instruction. That instruction is very long. Um, so it's rare that you will see that instruction as part of a Rob gadget. It might be in the binary, but the load effects instru uh, address instructions are usually at the beginning of a function. And you typically want things at the end of functions to chain these uh, gadgets. Uh, what um, you uh, might instead do is 
um, gadgets, usually really weird gadgets resulting from jumping partway into an instruction um, that does stuff like uh, push the stack pointer, pop REX, and then return. So this will move RSP REX essentially, right? Um, there are more dangerous ones. Um, wait, 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 hold on. I made a typo on the slide. I'll be right back. And we're back. Sorry about that. Um, had to fix up this slide. All right. So load effective address is not good. It's very long. It's not often found at the end of functions. You typically need a better alternative. There are a couple of different ways. These things are very situational. It depends on the gadgets available to you. Alternative one, something that'll push RSP, pop REX and return. This will move REX into RSP. You get the stack address. Of course, RSP remains intact. Another alternative is to add RAX RSP. This will, if uh, you pop zero into RAX um, in some other way, uh, then this um, will move RSP into RAX. Otherwise, it could offset um, RAX by RSP. Um, but conceptually, it still gets um, the value of RSP somehow into RAX. A crazy route is an instruction called exchange that actually shows up in um, um, uh, in, in, in binaries relatively frequently as a ROP gadget that will swap registers REX and RSP and then return. This is insanely dangerous. I'll go into why that is on the next slide. But the basic idea is if you can use gadgets in the... Um, uh, program to get addresses and compute addresses um, and so forth, you might need fewer leaks of uh, fewer data disclosure vulnerabilities than you otherwise uh, might need to actually perform an end-to-end -end attack. Um, so um, I mentioned Exchange RAX RSP is dangerous, right? Uh, if you don't like your stack, and there are many reasons why you might not like your stack. For example, your stack might be too limiting. You might not be able to read enough data to actually overflow, uh, or sorry, you might not be able to overflow enough data to have a long ROP chain, a long enough ROP chain. Um, you can try a stack pivot. So this exchange RX RSP will swap RX and RSP. When the next red happens, the uh, return address will be popped off of what is now your new stack, which is where RAX used to point. You better make sure when you do this exchange RAX RSP that uh, RAX is pointing to something reasonable. There are also gadgets that show up relatively frequently that do pop RSP, um, kind of conceptually similar. Usually it's they're misaligned into a part of an extraction, so it's part RSP and then some other stuff and then a ret. All right. Um, be careful about stack pivots, but it can be a powerful tool if your back is against the wall otherwise. Um, another ROP concept, how do you transfer data like, like to, to you know, memory and, and uh, from memory? Um, a gadget that is weirdly common are these, uh, or a group of gadgets is add a byte of memory to AL pop RBP red. I'm guessing this is some sort of a misaligned um, part of, a, of an instruction sequence that is common at the end of functions. I hadn't actually looked into it. Um, one um, downside is this typically requires, or this does require a gadget to set R RCX and to set AL. Um, gadgets to set RCX for whatever reason are surprisingly rare. Um, so this might not be optimal, but you can search for similar gadgets to store memory. The point is there are gadgets that will store memory. Um, nowadays, it's it's much less common in a ROP chain to need to build complex memory um, structures um, because we no longer pass arguments on the stack and so forth. Uh, but it does happen sometimes. Sometimes you are very limited by the chain, the ROP chains you can use initially, and then you have to build a secondary ROP chain memory um, using something like this. But but it's kind of an exotic um, thing. You likely 
won't do much data um, storage and, and retrieval in memory in your op chain. All right, another ROP concept, um, the syscall instruction, which you're very used to in shellcode, is actually very rare in ROP. Typically, you will need to call library functions. If you notice, in our um, example, um, we had, we called part of foo, which did an open. This is a library function. We did part of um, bar, which did a, now I lost it, which did send file, also a library function. Library functions are called through a special part of um, the binary called the uh, procedure linkage table. So if you look at 401070 up here in the PLT, here it is 401070. It's send file and it does a bunch of complex uh, um, stuff to look up the address of um, send file in libc and uh, jump there. Um, this will likely be the subject of another uh, later video or extended Q&A. Um, but in order to use library functions, you need to know where they are so you can write their return address onto a stack or jump there in some other way. Um, otherwise, you better hope that there's a syscall instruction inside the um, binary or a PLT entry inside the binary for the function you need. It's a little tricky. My advice, keep it simple. The um, shortest path to your flag is, is easiest. In this case, it was reusing open and send file in the binary in our example case. But um, if all you have is CH own, you can make that work. You have um, uh, in the previous module, you've carried out uh, shellcode with a single syscall. All right. Another ROP concept, know your environment, right? Your ROP chain doesn't just start executing in a vacuum. When your ROP chain starts, there's all sorts of useful information in the state. In the shell coding module, we had several um, levels where you had to use parts of the state that uh, registers that were already zero, so you didn't have to zero them out, etc. There's similar things here. There are addresses that are pointing to code, to the stack, to the heap, to libc, all over the place. If you need one of those addresses, then you can um, retrieve and reason about it in your ROP chain. You don't have to get it somehow from, from scratch. Um, use these addresses, right? Uh, it's, um, don't discard all of the rich information that's in the program state when you hijack control flow. Uh, I've done that in the past. Everyone does it. It wastes an enormous amount of time. Um, do yourself a favor and, and when you hijack execution to begin with, look at the values of all the registers, look at the value of the stack and see, you know, what in there you can use. All right. Finally, I keep saying, you know, you better hope this Rob gadget exists, that Rob gadget exists. How do you find Rob gadgets? When I first started out, it was a manual process, believe it or not. There was one tool, it was for Windows, um, and I don't think it was free, and it was just bad news. Um, but uh, now there are tools all over the place. I maintain a, a bunch of installers for CTF tools, and just that repository has um, installers for three different tools um, that people have written to find Rob Gadget. I'll show you one such um, tool. It is called RP++. Very easy. You do RP++. By default, it'll print out a bunch of duplicate gadgets at different positions in the program. This might be useful to you in case there's uh, constraints on your input, but uh, probably not. Tell it how um, uh, deep the gadget should be, how many instructions long. Uh, two is a good number. You can do more than two, but um, there it increases the chance that your gadget will have some crazy effects that you might not be able to compensate for that might make your program crash and then you give it the file and so let's give our ROP example these are the gadgets 
um, in our op example file. 50 unique gadgets, not a lot. Right, we have two of these um, at RSP8 red, so this is some stack cleanup and a return. I mentioned um, that at every add RSP, one byte into it is an add ESP. So there's an add RSP at 401.016 and an add ESP at 401.017. Why? Because it jumps right past that H and the H turns it from add ESP to add RSP. There's some crazy other gadgets. Well, here's that leave ret that we talked about. There's a lot of just ret, 14 of them, the most common gadget by far. Um, a lot of, you know, pop RDI, pop RSI and R15. Um, so RDI and RSI, those are the first two arguments already. That's pretty good. If you can figure out a way to zero out RDX, um, then, um, we're basically good to go to and, and figure out a way to trigger system calls. Then we're good to go. But of course, in this program, there are quite, um, there's very nice big gadgets that we used earlier. So you'll notice that the gadgets that we used to um, open and send file don't show up here. They're way too big, way too complex for our P++ to reason about. So it doesn't always pay to depend on these automatic tools. Um, if you do a bigger binary, something like bin bash, there's everything in here, right? Tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of gadgets. And again, these are misaligned instructions. They're like, uh, it, it, it could be all sorts of stuff. There might not actually be something like this. It's unlikely that there's something like this in the binary. We probably jumped partway through an instruction. Um, or there, there could be actually, but anyways, um, but there's a lot of stuff and I wanted to mention one thing and then show it to you. Realistically, once you have that list of gadgets, certain gadget um, um, chain uh, searchers can try to, or certain gadget finders can also try to build chains out of your gadgets. Um, doing that is similar to, you know, generating shellcode automatically in pwn tools. It'll work for some cases, but when it doesn't work, it'll waste in enormous amounts of your life. Um, you should be competent in searching through the output for your gadgets using regular expressions. Um, so let's say we wanted to uh, find a gadget that will set RDX, right? Um, so you can grab dash capital P enables all the Perl regular expression extensions. And we can say, okay, let's find something either move or add or sub or pop RDX. And there's shockingly little. Um, RDX is a tricky one. So here, this is a good one. So this pops RDX. And this is of course in bin bash, not in our tiny program. Pops RDX or EAX with some large number. So we'll have to restore EAX. We have to constantly fight against side effects and return. So that's great. Um, another one is this add RDX, RCX, but then we have to jump right to RDX. That's probably not good. Um, yeah, so, th so these are, th this one is probably the best for us. Um, likewise, if you want to find a gadget that you can write to memory with, you can do something like this. Um, writing to memory, of course, in, in proper um, Intel assembly, you do your operation and then your 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 memory size. Um, and so we can say, okay, there's a, a move, then a word, and then a open bracket. And here are all of the various ways we can influence uh, memory. Um, and so here's a good one. Move four bytes to RSI from DX. Um, yeah, so this, this is probably a good one because we just found how to set RDX. Now, if you find how to set RSI, I do the same for RSI. RSI is easy to set. There's right, right. RSI is shockingly difficult to set here. 
Am I full of crap? I am full of crap. Um, yeah, so in this case, RSI is actually not easy to set. How would we set RSI? Um, we would have to use something like this, but then we have to survive this call R13. So then we'd have to set R13. So now you can see how deep that rabbit hole can go. Um, all right, um, and that's it. That is the end of our um, uh, run through these uh, more advanced ROP concepts. You'll practice them, of course, throughout the module. Um, and in the next video, we'll talk about complications, even more complications.